This video is brought to you by Squarespace from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. Got more on them in just a bit. In February 1987, Israel kicked off the greatest war crimes trial in a generation. At the center of it all sat John Demjanjuk, a former citizen of the USSR who'd emigrated to America after World War II. By his own account, he was a simple, peaceful man, a retired auto worker and a grandfather living quietly in the Cleveland suburbs. But Israeli and American authorities disagreed. According to them, Demjanjuk's unassuming exterior hid a legendary monster. A former Treblinka camp guard so sadistic survivors still had nightmares about him. Zangard was known as Ivan the Terrible, and the quest to find out if Demjanjuk was really him would spark one of the biggest post-Nuremberg Nazi trials in history. Born in rural Ukraine in 1920, Demjanjuk would maintain until the end of his life that he was a regular village boy caught up in the horrors of an extermination war. Others, though, would accuse him of some of the most awful crimes ever recorded. Was this former peasant boy a man? or a monster. Today, we're going to take a look at one of Europe's darkest eras and ask if it's ever possible to know what's really inside a man's soul. Amid the ever-shifting narrative sands of John Demjanjuk's life, there are some hard facts both his supporters and accusers could agree on. He had been born, Ivan Demjanjuk, on the 3rd of April 1920 in a miserable village in the Ukrainian countryside, a farming hamlet physically just 100 kilometers from Kiev, but in reality was a lifetime away. His parents had both been disabled, requiring young Ivan to look after them, a struggle made harder by him only having four years of primary education. The last thing everyone agreed on was that he'd lived through some horrific times. When Ivan was just eight, the Soviet Union had instituted collectivization, a process of bringing villagers onto communal farms under state control. So when famine had broken out, people were reliant on the party to feed them. And in Ukraine, the party hadn't just abdicated its responsibilities, but used people's hunger as a weapon. The Holodomor was the deliberate, genocidal starvation of Ukraine's presence. Lasting from 1932 to 1933, it devastated the countryside, killing three to four million people. Among the places affected was Demyanyuk's village, where people were reduced to eating weeds in an effort to survive. Yet the Holodomor was just the first disaster to hit this godforsaken region. When Demyanyuk was 17, Stalin's Great Purge blew through the village like a dark hurricane. Amid the paranoia and denunciations, 22 people were executed. By now, the boy was learning that the best way to survive was to keep his head down, to just do his work as a tractor driver and a mechanic on their collective farm and try not to get noticed. Besides, life wasn't all bad. There were the pretty girls like Maria Zegrabelna, who he sometimes gave lifts to, ferrying them to the fields. But then the third great disaster struck, and even these small pleasures evaporated. In 1939, the USSR and Nazi Germany jointly invaded Poland. By 1940, Demjanjuk had been called up to serve, although his first attempt would be a tragicomic farce. One of the Red Army's rules was that conscripts needed to bring two changes of underwear. Ivan's family was so poor that he couldn't get a second pair, so he was sent back to his village. Not that Moscow would care about these rules for much longer. Summer 1941 saw Hitler pull a classic dick move by invading his erstwhile Soviet allies. Since they were closest to the German war machine, Ukraine and Belarus bore the brunt of the attack. When the Nazis arrived in Demyanyuk's village, they killed 120 people, nearly all the men in this rural outpost. Among the dead were two of Demyanyuk's male relatives. But not Ivan. By the time the Germans arrived, Demyanyuk was already fighting for the motherland. The Battle of Kiev that September was a doomed attempt to save Ukraine's capital from being surrounded. As part of the Red Army, Demyanyuk fought to defend the city, taking a bullet in the back on the shore of the Dnieper. Unbelievably, this made him one of the lucky ones. Nearly everyone who fought at Kiev was captured. Whisked away to hospital, though, Demyanyuk was temporarily spared. Temporarily, because in early 1942, this peasant boy found himself fighting again in Crimea. This time, there would be no escaping the Nazi onslaught. Demyanyuk's army career came to an end one hot, rainy day in the coastal city of Kerch. As the area was overrun, he was captured alongside 200,000 other Red Army soldiers, a moment that marks the point in his story where the narratives stop agreeing. For the rest of the war, two accounts would exist, one of Ivan the prisoner and one of Ivan Demyanyuk the mass murderer. Figuring out which was real would haunt prosecutors and survivors alike for decades. Thank you.
In Demyanyuk's telling, he spent the rest of the war in hell. While the Nazis treated British and American POWs with a modicum of respect, those captured from the Red Army had life expectancies on par with elderly mayflies. Of the 5.7 million Soviet army members taken prisoner by Germany, 3.3 million would perish from disease, starvation, execution, or being worked to death. That's 57% of all Soviet POWs. After Jews, Red Army soldiers were the second largest victim group of the Holocaust. In such an inferno, it's amazing Demyanyuk survived, a fact that he never forgot. As he told it, he was interred first in a brutal POW camp near Halm in Poland before being bounced to other camps where he was used as slave labor. By some miracle, he kept on living until 1945 when an American force finally liberated him. At least, that's one version of what happened. The story, let's say, of John Demyanyuk, village boy turned prisoner of war who'd later emigrate to the country that had saved him. But you already know there was another story, one written in the blood of thousands. That story we might call the tale of Ivan, the dark half. Demyanyuk may be kept hidden for years, told decades later in court filings and prosecutors' notes. This is Ivan's story. Not long after being captured in Crimea in 1942, Ivan and Demyanyuk learned of a way to escape the POW camps. With a whole load of new territory to oversee, the Nazis were recruiting what they called auxiliary police guards, volunteers who'd become better known as Troniki men after the camp where they were trained. Of the 5,000 plus Troniki men trained, virtually all were Soviet POWs. They were also mostly sadists, anti Semites, or psychopaths out to save their own skins. Volunteering to become a Troniki man didn't just mean taking on some light duties for extra rations, it meant actively taking part in the final solution. From their training camp, Troniki men were dispatched to ghettos and extermination camps like Sobibor and Belzets, ordered to help mass murder Jews. Ivan, though, would be sent to one of the most notorious of all. Treblinka. After Auschwitz, no other Nazi camp killed so many Jews as Treblinka. Nearly 900,000 people, including thousands of Roma, died within its walls. Only 67 inmates are known to have survived. And Ivan would have the distinction of making this hell so, so much worse. Later described as a tall, powerfully built Ukrainian in his mid-twenties, the Ivan of Treblinka was said to look remarkably like Ivan Demyanyuk. Like Demyanyuk, he had a simple, gentle air about him. Survivors remembered his kind blue eyes almost as much as they remembered his sadism. As Jewish victims were taken off the trains and herded naked to the gas chambers, Ivan would randomly pick out victims. Laughing and joking as he pulled them to one side, he'd gouge out eyes or chop off ears or noses with a sword that he carried. Other times, he'd beat people to death with a metal bar, or maybe lash out at the running crowd with his sword, seeing if he couldn't slice open a passing belly. This is just the stuff that we feel comfortable discussing, although we're not sure comfort is the right word here. There's eyewitness testimony of Ivan doing far, far worse things. Things will leave up to you to research by yourself if you want nightmares. Finally, once Treblinka's victims had been loaded into the 25-square-meter gas chamber, Ivan, with his mechanic's knowledge of engines, would turn on the motor that pumped carbon monoxide inside. At the height of the Holocaust, he was capable of working so fast that some 3,000 could be exterminated in just 30 minutes. Perhaps it's little surprise that he soon earned his nickname, one that would become a stain on John Demyanyuk's fortunes in the decades to come, Ivan Grozny, Russian for Ivan the Terrible. And just before we get into the rest of today's video, a quick word from today's wonderful sponsor, Squarespace. If you think about it, this really does seem to be the age of creation. Everyone is out there making a YouTube channel or a blog or a web store, stuff like that. You've either got a great idea yourself or you know someone who has one. And when it's time to move that project from your head onto the screen in front of you, that's where Squarespace comes in. Maybe you're the hands-on type with lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your website should look like. If so, very cool. Squarespace has all of the customization options that you could ever want and there's no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to complicate life. Or maybe you just need something functional, something that works with minimal thought. That's what I went for, so you can just focus on the content and not the coat of paint. In that case, pick one of their beautiful templates to make a website that is both fresh and simple and also for you. And once you're done setting up the website, locking in the domain, maybe playing with some of the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides that your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. Everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or 
or small. If it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics and you will save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. In total, Ivan Grozny is thought to have personally flipped the switch that led to over 800,000 dying in Treblinka's chambers. Even among the Holocaust's mass murderers, this would make him one of the worst. And yet, at the end of the war, no one could say what had happened to him. After an inmate uprising in 1943, Ivan the Terrible vanished from Treblinka. Not long after, the camp was razed and all remaining records were destroyed. It was this mystery, this void at the heart of Treblinka's story, that would later cause the innocent Demyanyuk so much suffering. Or alternatively, it was this disappearing act that would allow Demyanyuk to escape justice for so long. 1945 at last saw the two broken threads of his story twine back together. At the end of the war, everyone agrees, saw the one-time Ukrainian peasant living in a displaced persons camp in Germany. Like millions of others, Demyanyuk was waiting for the next chapter of his life to begin, the one that would hopefully take him far away from the European carnage. It would wind up being a hell of a wait. In the time it took for Demyanyuk's paperwork to be processed and his visa issued for immigration to the United States, he met and married Vera Belochnik, and they had a daughter. It wasn't until 1952 that the family were given the all-clear to move across the Atlantic. But move they did. Settling in Cleveland, Demanyuk took a job as a mechanic for the Ford Motor Company. He and Vera had two more kids. In 1958, the former Ukrainian became a naturalized U.S. citizen. To celebrate his new identity, he legally changed his name from Ivan to John. While it certainly helped him integrate, it maybe also helped the process of forgetting, of leaving behind all of the horrors that he'd seen in Europe. As John Demanyuk lived out his own little slice of the American dream, and a dream is perhaps all it really was. He worked hard and went to church. On weekends, he helped mend his neighbor's cars or fixed up local kids' bikes. When the family got a garden, he started growing vegetables. He was especially proud of his zucchinis. Perhaps, as this blissfully dull existence drifted on, it began to seem like his wartime experiences were fading, that maybe what happened in Europe had been the dream all along, and this suburban life right here was the only reality that he had ever known. Sadly for Demaniac, though, that's not how others felt. Those who'd survived the Holocaust knew how very real that hell had been. And they wouldn't rest until justice was done to the perpetrators. The first big one to fall was Adolf Eichmann. Known as the architect of the Holocaust, Eichmann was captured by the Mossad in Argentina in 1960 and then placed on trial in Israel the following year. His execution was a warning to the war criminals still in hiding that the story wasn't over, that they were now being hunted. Yes, it was a much less famous case that really showed what Demanyuk's future would hold. In 1964, the New York Times revealed that a friendly Queen's housewife was really Hermine Brownsteiner, the infamous stomping mare of Majdanek concentration camp known for the sadistic delight she took in kicking inmates to death. It was the beginning of a wave of such discoveries, as America was forced to face the fact that hundreds of Nazis had made it to the United States, either clandestinely or with active CIA help. But whilst this was an embarrassment for Washington, it was party time in Moscow. In the zero-sum game of the Cold War, anything that was bad for the other side was worth encouraging. And so it was that in 1975, Soviet agents handed a Ukrainian-American newspaper a list of former Soviet citizens who'd collaborated with the Nazis. Among the names was one that was destined to become infamous, Ivan Demyanyuk. The case against Demanyuk began slowly enough. At first, it was just an immigration and naturalization service investigation, since Demanyuk appeared to have lied on his paperwork about his Nazi connections. Evidence was soon found that placed him at the Sobobor extermination camp, one of the Troniki men who guarded the Jews as they were herded to their deaths. At this point, the Department of Justice got involved, and the case went crazy. When asked to identify collaborators from a set of photos, Jewish survivors picked out Demanyuk, but they didn't place him at Sobobor. No, they said that this man had been at Treblinka. They'd recognize him anywhere, since they kept seeing his face in their nightmares. He was Ivan the Terrible. And so began the long, complex legal battle that would consume the rest of Demyanyuk's life. First, there was the case to strip him of his citizenship, initiated in 1977 and only ending in 1981 when his U.S. passport was finally revoked. Then there was the series of lawsuits aimed at deporting him, at sending him back to Soviet Ukraine. But before he could be put on a plane, Israel intervened. If Demyanyuk really was the notorious Ivan Grozny, then they wanted to extradite him, to put him on trial, just as they had Eichmann. And yet more legal hearings were launched. 
Throughout it all, John Demyanyuk never swerved from his story that he'd been a prisoner of war, that he was an innocent, simple man who'd been mistaken for another. If he really was guilty, he told his son-in-law, the easiest thing to do would be to take a bottle of sleeping pills, will everything over to the family, save the family shame, and go to sleep forever. That he chose to keep on fighting, he explained, proved his innocence. The legal system disagreed. In February 1986, the Israeli extradition request was granted. Demianyuk was put on a plane and told he faced the death penalty, a verdict reserved in Israel for war criminals and genocide perpetrators. The trial opened in Jerusalem on February 16, 1987. Like the Eichmann trial before it, the whole thing was televised. The result was likely some of the most harrowing footage ever broadcast. We won't go over the survivor testimony here, the recounting of the crimes Ivan Grozny committed in Treblinka. But we will note the way the witnesses consistently agreed on one important fact. The man sat before them was indeed the sadist who tortured and murdered so many. I see Ivan in front of me, one declared. Other evidence soon mounted up. An ID card from the Troniki camp was supplied with the Soviet archives, one that showed Demyanyuk had been trained to help in the final solution. It wasn't him, Demyanyuk declared. The photo was a fake. But experts proved otherwise. Then there was the tattoo. In 1942, the SS started tattooing members with their blood type. Demanyuk had scars on his left arm exactly where that tattoo should have been, as if it desperately tried to remove it. Still, the defense under Israeli attorney Yoram Shaftel did its best. The Troniki camp ID was real, they contended, but it proved Demanyuk had been at the Sobibor extermination camp, not Treplinka. The plan was to effectively prove Demyanyuk was a collaborator, but not Ivan the Terrible. With just a single charge against him of physically pressing the switch that flooded the chambers with carbon monoxide, proving he was a different camp guard would at least spare him the death penalty. In the end, though, Demyanyuk forced them to drop the tactic. He was an innocent man, he kept repeating, as if he wanted it on the record. The trial ended on February 18, 1988. The verdict was guilty. On April 25th, John Demyanyuk was sentenced to death by hanging in what would have been only the second civil execution Israel ever carried out. But note the hypothetical there. Would have been. Because Demyanyuk would never feel the noose around his neck, never be cremated and, like Adolf Eichmann, have his ashes scattered at sea. Instead, events in Europe were about to upend geopolitics, and one small side effect would be Demyanyuk leaving Israel a free man. With John Demyanyuk declared guilty, an appeals process began, one that seemed cursed for the defense. In November 1988, one of Demyanyuk's lawyers fell to his death from a 15-story window in what was later ruled a suicide. A few days later, his lawyer, Yoram Sheftel, had acid thrown in his face by a Holocaust survivor, leaving him scarred and blinded in one eye. But for all this drama in Israel, it would be in Eastern Europe that Demyanyuk's fate was decided. In 1991, with the appeals process still underway, the Soviet Union gave one last terrific groan before collapsing into so many broken communist dreams. In Kiev and Moscow, archives once held in utmost secrecy by the KGB were thrown open. As historians raced east to make use of this treasure trove, Demyanyuk's defense team joined them. What they found there would forever end the Treblinka survivors' hope for justice. Ivan the Terrible had not been Ivan Demyanyuk. Eighty Troniki men who'd guarded Treblinka had been taken back to Ukraine after the war, questioned by the KGB, and then mostly executed, their statements living on in boxes of dusty old files. All of them reported that Ivan Grozny had been a man with the second name Marchenko, an engineer who took great delight in running the gas motors that killed thousands of Jews. What happened to him after he left Treblinka was unknown. Some said he had been shot in 1943, others said that he had been sent to Italy in 1944 only to vanish. There was even talk that he had been sighted in a brothel in Yugoslavia later that same year. In short, the fate of Ivan the Terrible was unknown. He may have died in the war, he may have lived a long, happy life, never once punished for all the cruelty he inflicted. The only thing certain was that he hadn't emigrated to the US and settled in Cleveland under the name John Demyanyuk. On July the 29th, 1993, Israel's Supreme Court overturned Demyanyuk's conviction. He was not Ivan the terrible. He hadn't tortured and murdered at Treblinka. He was a free man. At least for now, because the collapse of the USSR also revealed records that offered a different picture of Demyanyuk, not as a monster, but neither as an innocent man. Found in Moscow, the confiscated internal documents of Troniki camp finally offered a detailed picture of what Demyanyuk had done 
after being captured in Crimea. Like Ivan Marchenko, he had volunteered to help the Germans. Like Marchenko, he had been trained up as a Troniki man. And like Marchenko, he had been sent to ply his trade in an extermination camp. Rather than Treblinka, it had been Sobibor, and there was no evidence Demyanyuk had committed the vile, stomach-churning acts Ivan Grozny had. What there was evidence for, though, was Demyanyuk as Auxiliary Number 1393, helping her tens of thousands of Jews into the gas chambers. There had been no excess torture, no sword, no cutting off noses. No, just the knowledge that he was leading untold innocents to certain death, and that it happily traded all their lives to improve his own chance of survival. Although Israel could have tried him again for being at Sobibor, the government declined. In 1993, Demanyuk returned to the USA, but with something like the truth now out there, there would be no welcome home party. Although evidence of misconduct by the DOJ's Office of Special Investigations saw Demanyuk's US citizenship restored, the examination of his past didn't end. By 1999, the DOJ had evidence of Demanyuk helping perpetrate the Holocaust not just at Sobibor, but also at Madanyak and Flossenburg. In 2002, his citizenship was again revoked. Three years later, the deportation order came through. At last, in 2008, Germany declared it wanted to extradite him. There would be one final trial for Demanyuk. And this time, he would have to answer for the crimes he really committed. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, Germany didn't exactly fall over itself to try former Nazis. Oh, sure, the worst killers were mostly convicted, but the middlemen? Those who'd willingly murdered in the concentration camps or helped the Nazis round up undesirables? Well, a lot of them never saw the inside of a courtroom. And we're not just talking functionaries who passively helped the Reich commit its crimes. The historian Andreas Eichmüller has estimated that 6,500 SS members who served at Auschwitz made it out of the Second World War alive. Some of them vanished, some went into hiding. But a lot settled back into German society. In the following decades, only a hundred of these men were ever brought to trial, and a mere fifty were convicted. And this was just those at Auschwitz. Factor in the other camps, and thousands who'd facilitated mass murder never paid the price. It was only in the 21st century that Germany seemed to have a change of heart, that the hunt began for any surviving participants in the final solution. And it all started with John Demjanjuk. At first, the feeling was he couldn't be convicted. Precedent dictated that guards who'd never personally murdered anyone should be found innocent, especially if they were just following orders. That all changed on May 12, 2011, the day Demjanjuk was convicted as an accessory to over 27,000 murders at Sobibor. The verdict overturned decades of German legal thinking. The judge effectively ruled that simply by helping in the act of mass murder, Demjanjuk was as culpable as the vanished Ivan Grozny. He may have been scared. He may have been desperate to escape the horrific conditions in the Soviet POW camps, but the ruling said that he had a choice. And in becoming a Troniki man, Demjanjuk had chosen badly. In the aftermath of the case, a wave of special prosecutions began. Starting in 2013, German arrest warrants were issued against dozens of elderly people who had been connected with the camps. People like the Auschwitz accountant, Oskar Groening, convicted in 2016, aged 94. People like Bruno Day, a nonagenarian who'd been a camp guard at age 17 and found himself handed a two-year sentence by a juvenile court in 2020. Similar cases, made possible by Demjanjuk's conviction, are still ongoing. As the script was being written, 96-year-old former start-off camp typist Imgard Fersha made international headlines by going on the run before her trial could begin. Her case is just one of ten still making their way through the German legal system. Not that John Demjanjuk would see any of this. The former Sauberwar camp guard died in a German nursing home on March 17, 2012 age 91. Because his appeals had not yet been exhausted, he technically remains innocent under German law. Today, it's widely accepted that Demanyuk was not Ivan the Terrible, but just a low-level traitor, a man who volunteered to help kill Jews to save his own skin, and was never able to escape the consequences of that terrible decision. For some survivors, his eventual conviction was a source of comfort, acknowledgement that without these willing low-level operatives, the Holocaust could never have been as awful as it was. For others, though, the saga of Demjanjuk only dredged up horrific memories, acting as little more than a reminder that the real alive and the terrible never faced justice for his crimes. In a way, this paradox is the heart of Demjanjuk's story. He was an awful man, but there were worse. Karma caught up with him, but others got away. In the end, maybe all we can say is that John Demjanjuk's story is one that shows the trauma of Europe's 20th century, of a boy who suffered, then grew up to pass that suffering on to others in the worst way possible. He may not have been Ivan the Terrible, but Demanyuk was a guilty man. Whether he got the punishment he deserved or whether justice was really done, 
is up to each of us to decide. So I hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.